That's funny. I, last time we were looking at um, where the 6,000 year date comes from, that the earth 6,000 years old. We said you can't find a verse in the Bible that says it's 6,000 years old, but it's pretty easy to follow the chronology. When we look at the, um, the ages of the uh, patriarchs uh, there in Genesis 5 and uh, Genesis 11, and then we can trace from Abraham's call from uh, Ur and Haran uh, to the time that they left uh, Egypt as being 430, and then from the time they left Egypt to Solomon building the temple as being 480, and then you can follow pretty easily the line of the kings down the present time. Matter of fact, talking about the dating, and the more modern more modern dating, we're talking about this in history uh, class this past week, but the Greeks uh, started the Olympic Games in the year 776 B.C., and they kept up with those games so well has allowed us to date a lot of things around them because of that. Uh, that an event happened in the third Olympiad or the fourth Olympiad. As a matter of fact, we were talking about the um, some of the battles that Alexander the Great fought. He fought two great battles against the Persians, but we know the month and the day that even that he fought those battles. The battle of Isis he fought on November 5th, 333 BC. Uh, he, he fought the Battle of Guacamela October 1st, 331 BC. And it's amazing to me that they, they know the month and the day of that battle, not just the year. And so we, we can trace those, those years down, down through the line from that point on. We have the Bible record. It's pretty clear that it's about 6,000 years where that time went on. We ended uh, last time, and I poorly worded this question, but if we, you think about some of the uh, things we'll be looking at, evidences that mean that's the date that something happened, but it couldn't be any further than that. And kind of like this example of the coins uh, on a ship that's going across the Atlantic, if these were the dates that you have here, you say, well, when did that shipwreck take place? Well, since there are 1925 coins on the wreck, it couldn't have happened before 1925. And so that's kind of the principle of some of the things we'll be sharing with you and looking at with you pertaining uh, to these things. So as we look at the... Um, Again, to set those ages again, just for a moment, the summary of the ages, the, uh, the first 10 patriarchs who are all in our family tree, uh, so this is all of ours, everybody on the planet has this same line of 10 people as we go back in time, which is kind of neat. So this is all of our great, 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 however many great uh, granddaddies. And uh, as you look at the ages, we'll, we'll study those ages in just a minute. I was um, I ran across this. What to share with you? I don't know how accurate this is, but I heard one speaker say, if you look at the meanings of these names, like Adam being man and, and so forth, uh, Noah meaning comfort or rest. If you put their meanings together of their names, you get man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest, which is pretty neat. I don't know if that's just an accident or if that's inspired, but that, that's pretty cool. Uh, so again, I don't know if there's anything to that or whatever, but I thought that was pretty neat. If you study the ages, throwing out Enoch, of course, because he didn't die. Uh, he was translated, of course. The average age at death of these uh, ten in, the nine individuals was 912. All right, so the, that's the average age. Again, a lot of people look at us and say, do you really believe people live to be 912 years old? Well, I do, and you do. How could that happen? Well, I don't know. We're going to talk a little bit about that here in just a minute. Could be as simple as um, God speeding up the aging process. It could be that simple that it happened. Are there physiological reasons why that happened? I don't know. If you throw out Lamech's age, now if you look at Lamech, I've got a theory on that. Uh, 777, which is still a, a, a old age, would be, but much younger than the other individuals. And I, I mean, I, this is, I know this is speculation. need to stay away from speculation. Uh, if you calculate his age, he died five years before the flood. We talk about the violence that was in, on the earth there in Genesis 6. Was he murdered? Was Noah's daddy murdered? I don't know. That's speculation. But it's uh, interesting that he died much younger than a lot of these others did. But if, again, take out his age. 929 is the average age of these patriarchs. Is, is that really possible? So how could people live that long? As I just mentioned, it could just be as simple as, and, and certainly this could be a viable explanation. God just sped up the process as time went on. Could be. 
germs and uh, bacteria hadn't, yet, hadn't evolved yet. <laughs> well, that, that's true, true. Good point. Uh, and we're going to look at some of the things there about genetics. Genetics could play a role, our own genetics and the genetics, some of the bacteria, stuff like that, too. And thinking about the speeding up or slowing down, it reminded me of this. There's a disease, and y'all have seen this. I got a, a couple of photographs to show you. There's a disease called progeria, which is a disease where children age about 10 times faster than normal. And we've seen some of these. So if that was the if that's the case that in our own day that people can age 10 times faster, would it be possible that people age 10 times slower at one point? To me, that's reasonable. If you age 10 times slower, then you have the ages that you read about in the Bible. You know, some of these uh, pictures, I've seen pictures and seen stories of this. It's tragic. You know, here's a 9 or 10-year-old kid that looks like an old man, which is what progeria does. There's another little girl that's turned into an old woman. So, again, the idea is people say, well, it's ridiculous that people can live to be 900 years old. Well, on day, we see that people that age 9 or 10 times faster than normal isn't it reasonable that they could have aged nine or ten times slower at one point in time, that God could have slowed down the process? So whatever that's worth. So again, are there, so that could be it, just God slowed it down, but could there be physiological reasons, physical reasons why people live so long? Is there a, a possible explanation? We're going to look at this a little bit with you uh, here uh, as we get into the idea of the flood. The Earth's environment there, scientific evidence shows that the Earth's uh, environment was much, much different. The climate was much, much different at one point in time, and uh, we see evidence of that. And so some of the things that we'll look at that uh, archaeology has showed us must have been much different conditions. Was it conditions where people could have lived much longer at one time? Things grew much bigger before the flood. We'll look at that in just a minute, too. So here's some, some possible reasons. And again, y'all can add to any of this that we uh, look at. One is, and I've heard speakers talk about this, human genetics this far back in time, the first people would have been much purer than today. And I heard somebody illustrate it kind of like this. It's kind of like if you take a piece of paper and you put it on a copy machine and copy it. I get a copy and, and we got some really high quality printing machines today. It's a, it's a pretty good copy. Not quite as good as the original though. If you took the copy and copied it, and you keep copying the copy on down, originally, eventually the copies aren't quite as good and quite as pure. And so that's the idea that some say with our genetics. So while God, it, it, unbelievable how God set everything up and that you and I are, are here today and that uh, our genetic potential is so great, but our genetics as pure as it was at one time. Related to that, I thought this was an interesting point. I, I um, really had never thought about this. Uh, we had talked about this in passing uh, last week. Noah did not father children, at least those recorded. Did he have other children other than Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about any children before that. But we know Shem, Ham, and Japheth were not born until Noah was around 500 years old. So the fact that he was 500 when his children were born, even by the standards of that day, this was old to father children. If you look at those lists, I believe the oldest father... Uh, on record there, and again, some of them may have had children beyond that, but uh, Methuselah being 187 when his son was born. So that's the oldest. Noah's 500 when his sons are born. And from what I understand, older fathers even today sometimes can have children with genetic defects. Say an older mother, sometimes that is the case, but it, uh, uh, things show that even an older father, sometimes there can be genetic problems uh, with that being the case. So you got a 500-year-old man having children. Maybe that caused a, a change in the gene pool to some degree. And so they lost some of those genes for old age. Along that same line, I never had really thought about this too, but you had um, what you would call from just a genetic thing, a genetic bottleneck in the world. Because you got these, however many people on the earth, you got all of them wiped out except eight. And so, so you have that. The world population was reduced to eight people through whom every one of the world came. A century or so later, the Tower of Babel would cause another genetic bottleneck where each fledgling nation would begin with very small populations 
which would affect the genetic pool in a negative way. So you have this where the whole population is put down to eight. And then when they're at the Tower of Babel, we're familiar with that, talking about the languages. The languages are dispersed. And so then once again, however many few hundred people you got, they go their own separate ways. And so again, in each of those locations, you have a handful of people from which all the other nations came from. And so this could create genetic what say problems, but not as pure of genetics as it was at one time, and the loss of genetic information. I was um, looking at a video this morning. Matter of fact, it was talking about that with uh, just the fact that evolution couldn't have happened. And uh, evolutionists will look at things like different species, how that happens over time, whether it be Darwin and his finches, that some of the noses on the birds were different, or whether you got different species of dogs or different species of cats and this sort of thing. And one was saying, halfway joking, but I think it was serious too. Tell me if you look at all the dog kinds and you trace uh, trace that down to the modern time, he said a, uh, a poodle is about as low as you can get on the genetic gene pool of a dog. And the point he was making is that to get to that cute little poodle is actually a loss of information, not a gain of information. And so as you go through these things, that's what you have as you have that. You have a loss of genetic information, and perhaps in that is a loss of the aging thing or changing the aging process. I don't know if there's anything to that or not, but that's one explanation. We talked about the uh, canopy of water, and I mentioned to y'all that uh, there's a lot of creations are getting away from this now, so maybe there was not a canopy of water. It still seems to me that it would solve some problems related to how things could be like they were, but if this, if there was. So a canopy of water or water vapor or ice possibly surround the earth. This would block harmful ultraviolet rays and also help create a greenhouse effect around the world. I mentioned to you, the guy from Apologetic Express that I talked to, must have been six or seven years ago, I asked him about this uh, after he spoke to our kids. And he said he used to believe that too. He didn't believe it anymore because he felt like the earth would get too hot. Uh, so maybe he's right. I was talking with, uh, I think I told y'all, Brother Mike Marshall was saying that uh, that when he is at Antarctica, the scientists say the the holes over the poles could get bigger or smaller in time. So maybe God had a mechanism to release that heat. But that, that is one argument people say against the canopy. Um, water vapor only weighs 62% as much as dry air, which I did not know that until I was studying this. Uh, water vapor weighs less than air. That is what that said. I find that hard to believe, to be honest with you. But I guess that would explain why the clouds can hang up in the there. I don't know. That was new information to me. I just saw that a, a few weeks ago. And it says uh, three, the idea of a canopy of some type is interesting. There are, this one video I saw, said there are three planets today that have some type of canopies above them. So maybe again that ties into there could have been a water canopy at some time. Ago. But the point is, the point is that sun rays cause aging. As x-rays penetrate our body daily, except one speaker said on cloudy days and under concrete uh, keeps the harmful rays. So constantly we're getting hit with these x-rays, which causes the aging. The point is, if there was a water canopy of some type, it would keep all those harmful rays, or at least a lot of the harmful rays, from coming to, to the earth, slowing the aging process, and also slowing the aging process for the things that people eat as well, creating a healthier environment overall. Don't know if there's anything to that or not, but that's that's what some believe. I thought this was interesting. This kind of in, um, is actually a guy in uh, Texas, I think it was, that did an experiment on this just to see what could happen if you put animals in an ideal circumstance and did an experiment with fruit flies. And fruit, oral fruit flies, have been, people have been doing all kinds of experiments with them for 100 years. And I've seen pictures of fruit flies that have uh, wings coming out of the head and all kind of stuff. So it's cruel what they, they've done to those fruit flies. They did an experiment uh, with fruit uh, fly, uh, flies in hyperbaric conditions that lived 500% longer, five times as long. So if you had that worldwide, could that lengthen people's ages? I think it could. So that's one possibility. Another thing, I ran across this a few years ago, and I saw when Brother Mike was talking with me uh, after class the other day about this, and, and he had some interesting facts about the magnetic field. But the Earth's magnetic field, I never thought about that in terms of the aging or not aging and, and this sort of thing. But share with you a couple of things I found to be interesting. 
the magnetic field of the earth was much stronger at one time and is getting weaker. Right, scientists have been measuring the magnetic field going back to around 1829, 1830, 1831. So for almost 200 years, people have been studying the strength of magnetism on the earth. In those studies, since that time, it has fallen 14% since 1829. So the magnetic field around the earth is 14% weaker than it was 200 years ago. They estimate that it was 40%, is 40% weaker than it was a thousand years ago. So what impact, now evolutionists will argue, well, the earth goes through fluxes. Sometimes the magnetic field is weaker, sometimes it's stronger. There's no evidence that it can get stronger. I've not seen any evidence that it can get stronger. It can change poles. We'll look at that uh, here in just a second. But the fact that it's getting weaker is a proven scientific fact. We have seen nothing in recorded history when people have measured this that it gets stronger again. The current, the magnetic current gets worn down. They estimate that it loses half its energy every 1,400 years. At that rate, the magnetic field might have been 10 times stronger than it is now at the time of the flood and possibly 20 times stronger than it is now at creation. Say, so what, what does that have to do with anything? It would have lost energy faster during the flood. And so that would, you might have had a speed up of the loss of magnetism at the time of the flood. Figuring the temperature at which the crust would melt, the max age for the earth would be 20,000 to 25,000 years. So talking about that ship with the coins, this doesn't mean the earth is 20,000 years old or is 25,000 years old. But according to this data, if there's no strengthening, strengthening of the magnetic field, the oldest the earth could be is 20 to 25,000 years. That's a max age, which goes a lot more to what we believe, what the Bible teaches, than what the scientists teach with millions and billions of years. So that's another interesting thing, too. So again, if the earth is billions of years old, how could that be the case? But here's, here's the thing as far as age, and it, it, some of this is above my pay grade, so y'all, if y'all have more information about this, please share it with me. Exposure to strong magnetism stabilizes chromosomes, like the chromosomes of the body. So strong magnetism makes us healthier and makes our cells and everything else healthier. I had no idea. Also, the magnetic field helps deflect radiation from the sun. We talked about a potential water canopy doing that. Apparently, Earth's magnetism does the same thing. The stronger the magnetic field, the more harmful rays are deflected from the Earth. So again, if you had a stronger magnetic field at the time of the flood and creation, that would explain a lot of things, reflecting a lot of the harmful rays and so forth. The weakening of Earth's magnetic field each year impacts carbon-14 production. We'll talk about that more later on in dating. Less carbon-14 in the past means the tested specimens give off false older dates. So this is one reason why they date things they exclude information like this and say, well, the earth is this many thou tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years old. But again, if there was the carbon-14, uh, it would give you a false date if y'all follow what I'm saying. If I can say it like I want to, the magnetic field would have changed the way carbon-14 would break down over time. Uh, carbon-14 production is suppressed by a strong magnetic field. Carbon-14 must be a constant in the atmosphere for the carbon dating model to give accurate results. That's another side thing related to this magnetic field I wanted to mention to y'all. Now, the idea of pole reversals, you're, you'll hear um, evolutionists say, well, uh, poles can flip. Well, apparently that's, that's the case. Apparently that, that can happen. That has nothing to do with how strong the magnetic field is, though. So share this with you. Brother Mike was mentioned this uh, to me the other day. Uh, Sir James Clark Ross first discovered the North Magnetic Pole in northern Canada in 1831. So we're not talking about the the uh, the actual global North Pole, but the what they call the Magnetic North Pole. Apparently, it's two different things. Uh, since 1831, the pole has been moving. The Magnetic North Pole has been moving across the Canadian Arctic toward Russia. It doesn't stay put. Apparently, it's influenced by molten material under the Earth's surface is something that contributes to the level of magnetism. A survey in 2007 by Canadian-French International Collaboration determined that the North Magnetic Pole was moving approximately north-northwest at 34 miles per year. That was interesting. So it's changing like from here to Bagmanet almost. It's changing that much each year. According to the latest survey, it wasn't quite that much. Uh, it was about 28 miles per year. 
in, in recent times. Earth's magnetic field has been slowly changing throughout its existence. When the tectonic plates from along the oceanic ridges um, form along the uh, oceanic ridges, the magnetic field that exists is frozen into the rock as they cool below about 700 degrees Celsius. The slowly moving plates act as a kind of tape recorder, leaving information about the strength and direction of past magnetic fields. Magnetic north and south poles have even reversed or flipped, which is known as geomagnetic pole reversal. Now, I didn't put this in here because I think it's a bunch of garbage. In this article, they're talking about, well, over millions and millions of years. I don't think that's the case. If it's caused by, if molten rock and things moving around, I think you'd have a lot of that at the time of the flood. I think at the time of flood, you might have had a lot of flipping. It might have flipped a whole bunch uh, just in a year's time. Though they sound scary, pole flips can take a long time to occur and pose no immediate threat. Uh, and this is, I put this in. While there is uh, is evidence that the poles are moving, there is no evidence that the magnetic field can strengthen. And my prediction is it'll continue to weaken. We'll see if something happens where that changes, and I'll retract my statement here. Well, we'd be older if we were 20. I don't know if I agree it. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, uh, in some ways, the horn rays from the sun might have, might have not have been around all the time, but they, they uh, the eye doctors and like my doctor, uh, Scott Matt Martin. He said, if you could stay out of the sun when it reflects on you as much as possible, you won't have no problem. Uh, you won't have a whole lot of problems with your skin. Well, that's a great point, Charlie. And <laughs> my doctor and my wife get on me all that all the time about that. Make sure I got my wear my hat and. Sunscreen, all that. I leave off the sunscreen most time, but I have gotten better about my hat. I found this online I thought was interesting. Um, this diagram showing the movement of the magnetic North Pole. Again, here's the geographical North Pole. But it's kind of interesting how, um, and again, some of the things I saw just had it going here. Apparently, it kind of moved a little further south. And up. So, it, again, the point is that it's moving. So I will concede that point that it's moving. I won't concede the point that it's, it's changing uh, in strength. This is from about 1900, showing the movement, like if you're looking uh, down from above the North Pole, uh, how it is moving here. And so they say that they're projecting it's going to move further toward Russia. So uh, so we'll see. The same thing is happening in the South Pole. I won't get into all this too, but they have been measuring that. So as the North Pole is, the magnetic North Pole is moving, uh, so seemingly is the South Pole too. So shifting poles is different from magnetic strength, if y'all follow what I'm trying to say. Y'all have any other questions or comments on that? What causes it to move, though? That's a good question. And again, a lot of this is above my pay grade. But apparently it's the molten material under the ground that flows or whatever, and, and somehow that is related to the, the movement that's going on with the poles. Hmm. So, I've never heard that before. Yeah. Really, really and truly, if, if, if all this is happening, Keith, it's not going to matter because, as AOC said in 2031, it's going to all end anyway. But if you get rid of coal and oil and natural gas and all, and you know, use an umbrella when we drive, you know, the sun and everything, protect ourselves, who knows, we may live to be 200, 300 years. That's right. <laughs> I can challenge Methuselah. Yeah. Good point. All right, other, other uh, things related to uh, longevity. Possible possible reasons. Oxygen level, scientists say at one time were as much as 35%. Like they find these uh, amber bubbles sometimes in uh, ancient things. They said the oxygen level is 35%. Now, there are some skeptics who say, well, the reason 35% is other gases might have leaked out of that amber bubble. So th that could be too. But most scientists, creationist scientists and non-creationist scientists seem to agree the oxygen levels were higher at one time. Today in our atmosphere is about 21% oxygen. I think the, you got 79%, was it nitrogen, I think is uh, most of it, 78% of it. So 21% is oxygen. That world had at least 50% more than, a 50% increase in uh, the oxygen level than we have now. And you think about how that would affect your health. Uh, it have to be a positive thing. 
And when people are sick, what do they do? They give them oxygen. Uh, and so you got the potential of more like a hyperbaric uh, type conditions at that time. Um, get a water canopy, if that was the case, would have increased the weight of the atmosphere by at least two times. This would have made a much higher air pressure, which would have made living on the earth being like in a hyperbaric chamber. Healing of injuries would have occurred much faster. Plasma in the blood would become oxygen saturated, which means you could have run for miles. It would have been neat to have played football back before the flood. I mean, your, your, your guys wouldn't get tired. You wouldn't have to condition them at the end of practice. That would have been pretty neat. Uh, plants in those conditions are very productive as well. So, again, everything would have been, uh, had a lot more vegetation and lush vegetation. And another scientist, a creationist scientist, did an experiment I thought was very interesting. A scientist raised plants under pressurized CO2. The plant, he was growing like cherry tomatoes. The plant produced 900 tomatoes and grew 16 feet tall in two years. So 16 foot tall cherry tomato plant that produced 600 tomatoes on it under these conditions. It eventually grew 40 feet tall and produced 15,000 tomatoes in its lifetime. And they were growing baseball size, these, uh, these cherry tomatoes. So again, showing that the impact of something like this, that things appear to be healthier and so forth. So again, that could be one of the reasons why people live so long. And as Dad said, maybe AOC and others will fix this and we'll get back to those pre-flood conditions. I think those conditions are gone forever. I don't think you can get those back. Uh, one, one speaker was talking about this. Dinosaurs with lungs and nostrils of horses lived. So you got these huge dinosaurs and they got these very small nostrils and this sort of thing, how would they get enough oxygen? Well, I don't know. Uh, God could provide, but the, the point they were making is maybe it had uh, higher pressurized oxygen, making it easier for them to breathe. And this was neat, talking about hyperbaric conditions. And I remember this, and y'all probably do too. Baby Jessica, I don't know if y'all remember the story of her falling in a well, uh, forgot where it was, 30 years ago or something like that. And she got pinned down there, yeah, was down... Wasn't that down in Texas? It might have been in Texas, Charlie. I think I think you're right about that. Okay, okay, right, very good. So she was down there, I think, for two or three days, and they they finally got her out. And so everybody was took and take pictures of her and video of her, take res, rescue and baby Jessica and all this. But the rest of that story is I had not heard this, but when they pulled her up, like one of her legs was had turned black because it had been pinned behind her head and was oxygen cut off. And so one of the doctors said, we have to cut off her leg. To save her life, we need to cut off her leg. Another one said, before we do that, before we chop off her leg, let's, let's put her in a hyperbaric oxygen and see what happened. So they did that. They put her like in a 100% oxygen chamber, pumped up the air pressure, and before long, her, her leg turned pink again. I think they had to cut off like one of her little toes or something like that. But again, showing the healing effects of a, a large amount of oxygen under those conditions could really have a lot of health benefits for people at that time. Nutrition. I got this off the internet. And share. So my, my doctor, uh, Kenneth McLeod, every time I go to, I love Dr. McLeod, but every time I, I go with him, he fusses at me for not eating, eating my vegetables. So every time he'll give me a lecture about that and then he'll talk about, well, Adam and Eve, they didn't eat meat and stuff like that. So, and he'll always tell me that all you need to eat is, uh, or a day is about the size of your fist. That's about all the, the meat you need to eat. So I violate that on a daily basis, uh, pretty much. Maybe I need to listen to Dr. McLeod. He's in pretty good shape for his age. But many people believe that the earliest people were vegetarians. No mention of eating meat is made before the flood. Now, I'm a little skeptical of that. I'm not sure that you know people didn't obey God and a lot of other things, and I'm not sure I'm reading the scriptures where it was wrong to eat meat. But some will argue that, that they didn't eat meat until Noah's time. Maybe so, maybe so. If they were vegetarians, and I'm, I'm not necessarily conceding that point, but if they were, would that affect your longevity? And I got this off the internet. It says, though it is hard to definitively conclude that vegetarianism made some people live longer than others, there is definitely a correlation. In a study conducted over almost six years with over 73,000 people, vegetarians had a 12% lower risk of dying than meat eaters. All in all, the results of the study showed that vegetarian men live nine and a half years longer and vegetarian women live six, uh, over six years longer than average non-vegetarians. But, I, I, this was interesting too, it says, while the statistics uh, sound pretty convincing, it is easy to misread the correlation as causation. 
The numbers don't lie. The vegetarians did indeed tend to live longer than the non-vegetarians. But it's important to consider other factors that are prevalent among vegetarians. They are already more likely to be married, have a higher education level, be older, not smoke or drink as much, and be thinner. And all of this is not even considering their vegetarian diet. Another factor that might help explain the length in life is that vegans tended to weigh about 30 pounds less than their meat-eating counterparts. So the point is, there are experiments that show that vegetarians live longer, but it not, might not be the vegetables that they're eating, but just the fact that they uh, keep their weight more under control and that sort of thing. So the, even this right here, the jury is out whether being a vegetarian really caused somebody to live longer or not. Maybe it does, but I don't know that you can tie that to the ages of these uh, older individuals, Charlie. Well, uh, the way I see it, way back in there, when the earth was created, there wasn't no pollution. And the only time, I guess it was God or Lord, talked about pollution is when a person that was uh, doing something I wasn't supposed to do. He, uh, he let it be known that they were polluting. All right, all right. All right, good point, good point. Now, I mentioned this in this discussion. I uh, wanted to mention Antarctica, and again, Brother Mike kind of uh, spurred my interest a little bit, talking about that the other day, that he had been at Antarctica. That's, that's pretty neat. I'd like to visit there for a short time. I'd get pretty cold there, but it'd be neat to see. But Antarctica, um, evidence shows, again, talking about the climate of the world, uh, there are some creationist scientists and other scientists, too, that say that, well, maybe you had uh, worldwide um, temperate climates. And there's proof that Antarctica was like that, too. Now, again, why was that the case? There could be other reasons behind this. But a couple things about Antarctica. First, related to what we're going to be looking at, pretending the flood, this was interesting to me. Antarctica is the largest desert in the world. I don't know if y'all knew that. I did not know that. I was I was talking, uh, discussing a couple years ago in one of my classes uh, in world geography. I was reading what the book said. But the Sahara Desert is the biggest desert in the world. Somebody spoke up and said, "Well, I thought Antarctica was the biggest desert in the world." And so, um, so well, I, 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 I just kind of laughed it off and said, "Well, I'll look it up." And sure enough, he was right. Antarctica is the largest desert in the world. Almost never rains on Antarctica. It's like it's because it's too cold for the moisture even to be in the air, so it almost never rains. So think about that. At the largest desert in the world, where it almost never rains, in some places, no recorded precipitation has ever fallen on Antarctica. It has ice sheets 2.7 miles thick. Now think about that. For almost three miles thick of ice in a place where it's never rained. How could that be? The flood is the only explanation you give for something like that. So that's easy for us to figure out, but other scientists scratch their head and say, hmm, how could there be three miles of ice and there's never rain? Because of the flood. I think there's another great flood proof right here. Uh, I'm going to mention this more later on, but I did want to mention this too. Sometimes scientists will look at these ice sheets like that and they'll drill down and they'll get these cores that have a bunch of ice rings in it. And they'll say, okay, Here's how we can date it. We can count the ice rings. And each of the ice rings is a year. It represents an annual year. Well, no, that's not the case. Look, look at this right here. I thought this was interesting. In 1942, during World War II, planes took off from America and landed in Greenland. During the war, they were going over to, to help with the war. Because of storms, they abandoned those planes there in the ice. So they abandoned them, got other transportation, and went on to Europe. Left the planes there. People forgot about them. A guy later on, decades later, decided, you know, I want to find those lost planes. And he did. In 1988, they went with sonar, radar, and all that, and found those planes there in the ice. This is 46 years later. The interesting thing is, so we know in 46 years, those planes were covered with 250 feet of ice and snow. That is over five feet per year. And their ice rings, now they didn't get, I was trying to find how many ice rings there were, and I don't know if anybody counted them. So there were hundreds of ice rings, hundreds of ice rings, and that it only represented 46 years. So the idea of using ice rings to date is very inaccurate. All that would mean is a period of 
cold, warm, cold, warm. We see that in our winter sometimes too. It was 19 the other day and now it's 70 or whatever. So that's all that means. Ice rings are not an accurate way uh, to date the world. When we were in Alaska, you know, there's a lot of glaciers up there, and they were telling us that it takes 100 inches of snow to make one inch of the glacier ice. So depending on how much it snowed, these rings could be thicker or thinner. Yes, it could. Yes, it could. Yes, sir. That's a good point. Good point. Some believe tropical conditions existed worldwide at one time in Earth's past. Uh, trees, plants, and leaves have been found in and under the ice in Antarctica. There's not a tree growing there now. But they find trees frozen in the ice and leaves frozen in the ice. The, I can't, you can't see the picture very good. Here's a fossilized tree trunk on Antarctica. There are no trees now, but at one time, Antarctica had trees on it, which is kind of neat. And I found this online. Today, the frozen Antarctic ice uh, sheets border the Southern Ocean. The tropical palm trees once flourished there. An intense warming phase occurred years ago, leading tropical vegetation, including palms and relatives of today's tropical trees, to grow on the continent's now frozen coast. The surprising discovery came from a study of drill cores obtained from the seafloor near Antarctica. The results published in the journal Nature show that warm ocean currents and high carbon dioxide levels in the air boosted temperatures, allowing tropical vegetation to grow where visitors today meet only icebergs and freezing cold. Here's a quote. The CO2 content of the atmosphere is assumed for that time interval is not enough on its own to explain the almost tropical conditions uh, in the Antarctic, uh, said this individual. If y'all pronounce the name, y'all go ahead. Uh, huge coal deposits exist on Antarctica, which is interesting to me. Where does coal come from? Well, trees and vegetation that have been smashed down over the years and covered with mud and all that. So how do they have huge coal deposits? Had to have been a lot of vegetation on there at one time. So it appears to have had huge forests at one time. Admiral Byrd, he was the first one to fly over Antarctica, I think in 1929 or thereabouts. Uh, he saw palm trees frozen under the ice as he flew over. Thousands of preserved leaves have been found there, including some of the transatlantic mountains about 250 miles from the South Pole. The leaves are not fossilized, indicating that was the case more recently than most scientists want to admit. Now, you and I can admit that. 4,300 years ago, 4,400 years ago, was a flood that explains why there's, it's only a few thousand years old that you see those things. 400 miles from the South Pole, they found dinosaur remains as well as dinosaur footprints. We're going to talk about that later on too. But there are dinosaur, dinosaurs were on Antarctica at one time. Similar, they have, similarly, they have found frozen dinosaur bones in Alaska that are not fossilized, as well as dinosaur footprints that have also been found there. So it's interesting you see some of those conditions in, in places worldwide. So again, the, the water canopy might be an answer for that, kind of creating like a greenhouse effect everywhere else. Uh, it could be, uh, was Antarctica in a different location at some point? Did it move to where it is? That's another possibility. And it could be, I think Brother, Brother Lloyd talked about the tilt of the earth. Was the tilt of the earth different at one time? Could explain some of those things uh, as well. Would kind of support the theory of the axis doing the fluid being changed. It very well could. It very well could. So axis, of course, is the imaginary line. I tell the kids there's not you know, some of the Christmas movies you see a pole at the North Pole. There's no actual pole, of course, as y'all know. But it's the imaginary axis on which the Earth uh, rotates. And today it's about 23 and a half degrees. Some scientists believe the Earth is wobbling some. Can vary between 22 and 24 degrees, but for the most part, it's at 23 and a half degrees. And that tilt, of course, impacts our weather as we know. Right now, we are actually, I've heard people say in December or January, we're actually closer to the sun right now than we are in, in uh, July. You think, well, why isn't it warmer? We're close to the sun. It's because we're tilted away from the rays. We're getting indirect rays at this point. I found this online. I thought this was interesting. There's something called the Chandler Wobble. It's a small deviation of Earth's axis of rotation relative to the solid Earth, which was discovered by American astronomer, astronomer Seth Carlo Chandler in 1891. It amounts to a change of about 30 feet in the point at which the axis intersects the Earth's surface and has a period of 433 days. This wobble, which is a nutation, combines with another wobble with a period of one year so that the total, uh, total polar motion varies 
with a period of about seven years. All that really is irrelevant, but I've heard, I have heard somebody that had a theory that kind of what you're saying, Brother Lloyd, that the earth might have been more straight up and down at one time and got hit maybe by an ice comet. Maybe that could have had a role in the flood and that that put us over on our axis today. I don't know. What would be the earth be like if it was not tilted? Now, I found this a few years ago, and I'm glad I did, because now I looked this up again the other day. I couldn't find anybody that said this. The thing about the, the tilt, it was all related to uh, climate change and global warming and stuff like that. They couldn't even talk about it intelligently. But I thought this was interesting. And they, this is my words. I copied and pasted this. I stole it. In this case, the plane of the Earth's poles would always be perpendicular to the sun. Every day would be like what it is cur currently on the equinox, since every location on Earth would be about 12-hour sunlight days, and the noon sun angle would be about the same every day. There would be, no longer be seasons as we know them. The temperature and precipitation pattern would not vary much. It would still be warm at the equator and cold at the poles. The most profound impact on temperatures would be at the poles. The polar areas would have much more uniform temperatures year-round, and the sun would always be low on the horizon. Across the Earth, it would be like it is in the middle of fall or spring, but it would last all year, every year. Areas today that have wet, dry, warm, and cold seasons would have a fairly constant weather all year, whether it be wet, dry, warm, and or cold. There would still be some slight changes during the year, even though there would not be seasons as we know them now. The Earth's sun distance does vary during the year. Currently, the sun is closest to the Earth in the northern hemisphere winter and further away in summer. With no tilt, this change in Earth-Sun distance during the year will produce a slight impact on the weather pattern. It would be uh, must be emphasized the impact would be small since the Earth-Sun distance is not much different. Uh, they're a few million miles. Earth having tilt has a far greater impact on the weather pattern. But without any tilt, the Earth-Sun distance would have the dominant impact on seasons. So again, that's one possibility. Now, going back in Genesis 1, it does talk about the, the sun and the moon and all that be given for seasons. So, again, they could tell from the, uh, the angle of the sun and so forth uh, various things about the seasons. So, I don't know. But that's one theory and that's one possibility of how you might could have had kind of a warmer climate all the way around. So, that, that's, anyway, neither here nor there. And that's kind of the end of that that I wanted to mention. But my point is, there could be physiological reasons why people live to be 900 plus years old. It could be just simply God uh, sped it up afterwards. So I'm not sure the answer on that. Before we move on to the flood, and that's what I want to look at in the next topic, y'all have any uh, comments, uh, observations, anything you want to add to any of that? Well, one Char thing, I, uh, I knew a guy that went to the state of New Mexico, and he said they have more drought than they do rain, and the only water they can get on the land of New Mexico is when the mountain uh, snow melts and the water runs down. That's about the only time they get water on the ground. It's real interesting the different climates you have around the world and a lot of things that we take for granted. You know, sometimes we complain about it raining too much or, but, you know, we, we get, uh, we're blessed in that respect, uh, having plenty of rainfall and, and that sort of thing, and some people do not. There's, a, there's an ice cave, I don't know, it's Arizona, New Mexico, one or the other. That is a real airy place like Charlie's talking about. So, and you go to caves other places that are dry ice in, so why is there ice in that one cave in a dry climate, you know? Right. I don't have an explanation for that. I don't either. <laughs> That's interesting. So as we get into Genesis 6 and verse 1, we see in uh, Genesis 6 and verse 1, it talks about the population uh, growing. So you had a population explosion during this time. So at the time of the flood, how many people lived on the earth? The Bible doesn't say, and it's just an estimate to say. Uh, if, the, if, you, if, you, if you follow those individuals of uh, patriarchs, we get to Noah, who's the 10th generation. So Shem, Ham, and Japheth would be the 11th generation going back to Adam. But there could have been others that were 20 generations long. Uh, so we, again, we talk about some of the ages when they had kids, but certainly some of them might have had kids much younger than Methuselah at 187. Anyway, if you just used 11 generations, 
if the average person averaged six children, if you start with Adam and Eve, this is what I came up with my calculations, if y'all want to double check me. If you start with two, and each couple had six kids, you'd have almost 200,000 people by the time of Noah. That would be pretty reasonable, especially if you're living that long to expect that everybody would have six kids. If you up that to 10 kids, you would have a population of almost 50 million by the 11th generation. If you had 20 kids, you would have 20 uh, billion by the time of the flood, if that was the case. Now, if you had 50 kids, now somebody said 50 kids, that's ridiculous. Jewish tradition says Adam and Eve had 56 children. That's not in the Bible, but Jewish tradition says uh, they had 33 sons and 23 daughters. I don't know that that's true or not, but figure somebody that lived that long and they were healthy and all that, I guess it's possible. But if that were the case, you'd have 152 billion by the flood. So I don't know how many there were, but easily, easily could have been in the millions and billions by the time of the flood. When you talk about the, the rain that began and, and all the, the things we'll look at uh, with that later on. So Lord willing, we'll get in the flood and we're going to talk about that the next two or three weeks uh, with y'all. Thank you for your good attention and good questions and comments. Well,